During the First World War, Britain's railways came under government control. After that conflict, nationalisation was proposed, but proved to be unachievable. So instead, the Railways Act of 1921 was passed, which grouped the railways in 1923 into four large companies. The Great Western, the Southern, the London Midland and Scottish, and the London and North Eastern. In this series, we'll take a look at each of these companies, their engineers, policies and innovations that they brought, as well as what remains of them in the preservation era. This is the Big Four at 100. We start with the railway least affected by the grouping, the Great Western. Dating back to Brunel's broad gauge, the company had its own series of takeovers starting in 1844. By 1923, it became the largest single amalgamation with the second largest stock list after the LNWR. Its network radiated from Paddington to Birkenhead in the north, to Wales and south to the west country. Its two principal main lines, meanwhile, ran to Penzance via Bristol and Plymouth and to Birmingham. In 1923, the GWR inherited seven constituents and 26 subsidiaries, with 3,800 miles of track. In England, these included the Didcot, Newbury and Southampton, the Midland and South Western Junction, and the Forest of Dean Central. The bulk of the constituents came from Mid Wales, notably the Cambrian from Oswestry to Pethwilly and South Wales. The latter served the valleys, including the Brecon and Merthyr, the Port Talbot and the Taff Vale. It also inherited three narrow gauge railways, which had been taken over by the Cambrian. One of these was the 1 foot 11 and a half inch Vale of Rydal from Aberystwyth to Devil's Bridge, which opened in 1902 and taken over in 1912. Using three Davis and Metcalf 262 tanks, freight consisted of lead ore and timber. But the railway's principal traffic was tourists, and the line would survive until 1989, the only break being during World War II, and subsequently became the first part of British Rail to be privatised. Another was the 2 foot 6 inch gauge Welsh Pull and Clan Fair. Opened in 1903, it was worked by two 060 tanks from Bayer Peacock, the Earl and Countess. Constructed to serve the surrounding farming community, the line featured a unique section through the town of Welshpool. Passenger services ended in 1931, whereafter the line became freight only. The Great Western's principal works was at Swindon, founded in 1842. Eventually reaching 140 acres, a railway village grew up around the works. Its first locomotive emerged in 1846, with the famous A shop being completed in 1902. After taking over from Caffilly and Wolverhampton, Swindon became the sole workshop for the GWR. A carriage and wagon complex was later added, whilst the former Caffilly Wagon Works was moved to Cardiff in 1930. The first engineer to have a significant impact in our period is George Jackson Churchwood, who started on the South Devon in 1873 and moved to Swindon in 1876. Becoming carriage works manager and assistant to William Dean, he eventually became CME in 1902. Dean came to office during the transition period between the broad and standard gauge eras. Churchwood set about initially refining Dean's designs, but soon planned a fleet of modern locomotives, using ideas from the USA and Europe. This would eliminate the multitude of designs either inherited from earlier takeovers or from the transition period. The small fleet of standard classes would cover a wide range of duties and use common components for a more efficient construction and maintenance program. Four types of boiler were produced with a bell pair firebox. These had a more efficient, narrow sloped grate with a larger water space and tapered to help build up steam pressure. Keen to experiment and try out some modifications, Churchwood produced nine standard types between 1903 and 1911. He also remodelled Swindon Works and installed the first rail testing plant in Europe, which opened in 1904. 
Churchwood was replaced in 1922 by Charles Collett, who adapted many of Churchwood's designs. Joining the GWR in 1893 as a junior draftsman, he became Chief Draftsman's Assistant in 1898 and Assistant Manager in 1900. Collett was Churchwood's assistant from 1919. With many elderly locomotives still around and with rising operating costs, Collett set about creating his own modern fleet, but very much followed Churchwood's school of thought. Another change he would make was to upgrade the testing facility in 1926. This included installing a new optical alignment system for chassis development, which allowed finer tolerances and improved wear. As train loads increased after the war, so did the demand for a more powerful locomotive. Collett's solution was the castle, essentially a copy of the Churchwood Stars with a larger boiler and cylinders, but remaining within the 20-ton axle loading imposed by the civil engineer. The frames were also extended to allow a larger firebox and cab. 15 would be rebuilt from the Stars, with one from the GWR's only Pacific, the Great Bear. Later, larger superheaters and double chimneys were fitted, with production continuing until 1950. The first castle, number 4073 Caffilly Castle, was displayed at the British Empire Exhibition at Wembley in 1924. Alongside was the LNER's A1, number 4472 Flying Scotsman, with Great Western claiming the castle to be more powerful. A series of trials were conducted, with the castle proving to be superior, resulting in the A1s being rebuilt as A3s. In July 1923, the GWR launched the Cheltenham Flyer from Paddington to Cheltenham. Weighing 265 tonnes, the train was allowed 75 minutes to cover the 77 and a quarter miles from Paddington to Swindon at an average of 61.8 miles an hour, making the flyer the fastest scheduled service in the UK. The castles took the flyer in their stride, with the inaugural train arriving three minutes early. It was soon the fastest train in the world, with an average speed of 71.4 miles per hour by 1931. The following year, number 5006 Tregenna Castle set a new record, averaging 81.6 miles per hour. By 1927, the title of most powerful locomotive had been lost to the Lord Nelsons from the Southern. The GWR's general manager, Sir Felix Pohl, immediately ordered for a new locomotive to reclaim the title with the civil engineer, J.C. Lloyd, agreeing to add an extra half a tonne to the axle loading limit. The answer was the King class, and a series of improvements was carried out, with a planned launch ready for the summer timetable. The first member, number 6000, appeared in June, later taking part in the centenary celebrations of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad in the USA, being presented with a commemorative bell and capside medallions. Back in the UK, number 6003, King George IV, was involved in a derailment caused by independent springs on the bogey. This led to a redesign, but in service the kings were so heavy they became restricted to the Wolverhampton and Plymouth main lines. On the latter, they tackled the South Devon banks unassisted and allowed a four-hour service from Paddington. On the mixed traffic front, Collett once again looked to Churchwood. By this time, the 4300s had limited use and a plan was drawn up to rebuild some of them as 460s. However, this was dropped, with Collett rebuilding Saint number 2925 St Martin with smaller driving wheels and undergoing three years of testing. During this time, outside steam pipes were fitted, the boiler pitch altered and the bogey wheels reduced in size. Production eventually started in 1928, with the first 14 going to the southwest. Known as the Halls, the class was a true made of all work, with 178 ordered before the first 80 were completed. Allocated across the GWR, 11 were converted to oil firing in 1946, being renumbered in the 3900 series, 
but the experiment was dropped in 1950 on cost grounds. Since 1908, the GWR had promoted itself as the holiday line, establishing camping coaches at places such as Blue Anchor and Gara Bridge. It provided a bus service to beauty spots, cruises from Plymouth and some of the first country house hotels at St Ives, Fishguard and Morton Hampstead. A series of postcards was produced alongside puzzles and books. One of these was an annual holiday haunts guide which listed the resorts and attractions particularly in South Wales and the West Country. Another was a traveller's guide series entitled Through the Window. To work the many small branches serving these resorts, Churchwood had produced a prototype number 115 in 1905. This led to a range of what became the small prairies, starting with the 10 4400s emerging from Wolverhampton. This was developed into the 4500 in 1906, with larger wheels, with the first 20 again coming from Wolverhampton. College contribution was the 4575, with larger water tanks sloped at the front for better vision. Their work took them across the GWR, with concentrations in the West Country, the West Midlands, Wales and the Cotswolds. The bigger version, the Large Prairie, dated back to prototype number 99 in 1903. Various forms came from Churchwood's drawing board, whilst Collett designed four classes, the first, the 5101s, appearing in 1929, being an update of the 3100s from 1905. The changes included a new running plate, lower cab roof and larger bunkers. The 5101s worked mainly on secondary routes and as bankers in the Golden Valley and through the Seven Tunnel, with construction lasting until 1949. In 1931, the 6100s appeared for suburban duties around Paddington. Similar to the 5101s, but with a higher boiler pressure, the class monopolised the Paddington trains, although some found work further afield. The two other classes were the 8100s in 1938, rebuilt from Churchwood's 5100s with a higher boiler pressure and smaller driving wheels, and the 3100s in the same year. The changes were the same as the 8100s, but applied to the 3150s for mixed traffic duties. Away from passenger trains, the Great Western was the largest dock company in the world. Its main export was coal from South Wales, regarded as the finest in the world, with ports at Bristol and in South Wales itself, supported by a network of lines in the Welsh Valleys, with some even having two railways. Competition had been fierce from both the Midland and LNWR, which was one of the reasons for building the Seven Tunnel. At its peak, trains reached 80 wagons, but this slumped dramatically after the Great Depression. For its customers, the Great Western offered a complete package, from equipment and storage to specialist wagons. For the coal traffic, these had end-on doors for tipping into ships. Wagons were also provided for cars, fruit, fish and even aeroplane propellers, with each wagon having its own telegraph code. Other forms of freight included agricultural from the West Country, carried in vacuum brake stock and given express status. To help with the distribution, the GWR developed its own freight network, with major centres at strategic locations. To handle all of this freight, particularly from South Wales, eight coupled tanks had been used by the Vale of Neath and Barry Railways. Taking inspiration from these and the USA, Churchwood drew up a 280 number 97 in 1903. The 280 was more stable and shared common components with the prototype Saint number 98. Classified 2800s, they featured larger cylinders, a higher boiler pressure and superheaters from 1909. Collett made some alterations, most notably an enlarged cab and outside steam pipes. Known as the 2884, the first member appeared in 1938, with construction continuing until 1942. For short-hauled workings in the valleys, 280 tanks were employed. 
capable of handling 1,000 tons on steep gradients, the first class, the 4200s, shared the same frames, wheels and boilers as the 2800s, the first appearing in 1910. The 5205s from 1923 had enlarged cylinders by half an inch and outside steam pipes. Production ceased in 1934, but restarted briefly in 1940. Both classes received modifications, being outside steam pipes for the 4200s and frames on the 5205s. Both could be found in the valleys west of Cardiff, and from Seven Tunnel Junction to Clenethley. Another icon of South Wales was the 062 tank, started by the Taff Vale in 1885. Later adopted by the Rumney, Barry and Cardiff Railways, 400 were in service by 1923. In a classic example of it isn't broken, an updated version, the 5600, was designed based on the Rumney's R-Class. With a distinctive front overhang and large smokebox saddle, 50 non-Swindon examples came from Armstrong Whitworth in Newcastle. Working on routes barred to the 280 tanks, the 5600s hauled empty wagons uphill and loaded ones downhill, with the trailing axle providing stability. They also handled passenger excursions to towns such as Porthcrawl and Barry. Following the Great Depression, the government announced the Development Act of 1929 to create employment. On the Great Western, this saw improvements made at Paddington, Bristol and Cardiff to ease congestion with additional tracks. Some depots also received improvements, however the road service was sold off, but the company still took a share in the new owners. One result of the depression was the laying up of 30 5205s, as there was no work for them. To help increase their potential, they were rebuilt as 282s, with an enlarged bunker to extend their range. Classified 7200s, the program was applied to the 30 5205s and 14 of the 4200s. Some had scuttle bunkers, which held extra water, with the coal space moved further forward. A small number worked in South Wales, but the rest could be found across the system, from the home counties to hauling iron ore around Banbury. Throughout its existence, the Great Western came up with some novel and forward-thinking ideas. One of these was the auto train, whereby a locomotive was connected to a coach through linkages. These links ran from a cab in the coach, worked by the driver, to the locomotive, controlled by the fireman, eliminating the need to run round with communication provided by bell codes. For these trains, the GWR built special coaches, known as auto coaches, and a specialist 042 tank locomotive, the 1400s. Based on the Armstrong 517s of 1868, the class was originally classified 4800, but changed to 1400 when oil-fired 280s had their own numbers changed. There are also 20 non-auto-fitted examples, the 5800s. Another novelty was the pannier tank. The GWR already had a fleet of small tank engines, but these had become life expired by 1923. The most numerous was the 5700, tracing its origins back to the 2700s of 1896 and given a bell pair firebox and higher boiler pressure. No prototype was built, with 100 coming straight from the drawing board. As well as Swindon, private companies received orders as part of a government employment scheme, leading to several variants. These included the 6700s with steam heating, the 8750s with larger cabs, and the 9700s with condensing gear. Once again, the type found employment across the system, from branch lines to shunting and ECS duties. 13 were fitted with spark arresters for working at army depots during World War II, whilst the 9700s handled cross-London freights. A very forward-thinking idea was the diesel rail car. The first example of this was a petrol electric, trialled by the North Eastern in 1902. This was later developed into the steam rail motor 
and ultimately the auto trains. Designed by C.F. Cleaver of Hardy Rail Motors Limited, the first examples were inspired by the flying hamburger units in Germany and given an Art Deco style. Hardy was a subsidiary of the Associated Equipment Company and fitted the rail cars with the same 130 brake horsepower engine used in London buses. The first examples came from the Park Royal Coachworks at Wheelston and had 69 seats. First shown at the International Commercial Motor Transport Exhibition in 1933, it proved to be an instant success. The first journey from Paddington to Reading took place on the 1st of December 1933. Later services ran to Slough, Windsor and Didcot, clocking up 60,000 miles in the first year and carrying 136,000 passengers. The total number was 38 units in various forms from Park Royal, the Gloucester Carriage and Wagon Company and Swindon. Three units from 1934 had a buffet added for working between Birmingham and Cardiff, the first long-distance diesel service in the UK. Over in Wales, the Cambrian Main Line from Shrewsbury to Aberystwyth and Puthwilly had always proved to be something of a headache for its operators. This was because the bridge at Barmouth was constructed from timber and had a severe weight restriction limiting the size of the locomotives which could cross it. By the late 30s, a scrap and build policy had been deployed with one result being the Duke Dogs of 1936. Using a Duke boiler on a Bulldog chassis, construction ran until 1939, only being cancelled because of the war. Starting out as the 3200s, the plan was to keep the old Duke names, but these were transferred to the castles, with the class being renumbered in the 9000 series after the arrival of the 2251s. The next new class to arrive on the Cambrian was the Manners. Intended as a replacement for the 4300s, the Manners were lighter than the Halls and Granges, utilising some components from withdrawn 4300s and a scaled down Swindon No. 1 boiler. However, the blast pipe and chimney were too small, which stifled the drafting. 100 were planned, but in the end only 20 appeared under the GWR, followed by another 20 in 1950, but the drafting wasn't solved until 1952. Their association with the Cambrian goes back to 1938, when number 7805 Broom Manor was trialled from Rewaben to Barmouth, although arrivals didn't start until 1943. Based at McConflith, they regularly worked the Cambrian Coast Express, often being balled up, as well as local duties. When war broke out, the Great Western achieved a remarkable feat, evacuating 112,994 people in 164 trains in just three days. These all worked from Ealing Broadway to relieve Paddington, with 58 of them running on the first day. A further 57,985 evacuees would follow from the West Midlands, Liverpool and Birkenhead. During 1940, Swindon produced parts for hurricanes, searchlights, radar stations and barrage balloon fittings. Another aircraft company to benefit from the works was Short Brothers, whilst shell production reached 2,500 every week. On the LMS, the Stanier 8F was adopted as a War Department standard. Stanier had trained under the GWR, with the 8Fs being based on the 2800s, and during the war, 80, numbers 8400 to 79, came from Swindon. A few locomotives even came from storage, including 100 Dean Goods, in a repeat of their service during the First World War. Some received modifications, with the fitting of pannier tanks and condensing equipment. In 1941, Collett was replaced by Frederick Hawksworth, whose father worked in the drawing office. Joining the GWR in 1898, he joined the drawing office in 1905, becoming chief draftsman in 1925. Unfortunately, due to wartime constraints, Collett was very restricted in his work, being limited to only rebuilds or updated designs. 
He is, however, credited with working on a Pacific, the Cathedral class, which would have been the GWR's first since the Great Bear in 1908. By the time of his arrival, the Great Western had fallen by the wayside, as other railways had caught up. His first locomotive was an update on the halls, with a plate frame bogey and the cylinders separated from the saddle, but incorporated the steam pipes. He also fitted a high degree superheater to combat the poor quality of coal. Some improvements to the drafting were made, with hopper ash pans fitted and a flat sided tender for better protection. The modified halls followed the standard set by the college examples and were popular with crews. A regular duty was into regional trains from the southern, from Poole or Bournemouth to either Leicester or Nottingham via the Great Central. After the war, the counties appeared, the company's last 460. They had plate frame bogies and separate cylinders like the modified halls but with straight splashes and the boiler copied from the LMS 8Fs. The initial batch of 10 was increased to 20, with the first member being outshopped in 1945. The class was to total 65, but this was reduced to 30. Names were applied from 1946, with some coming from withdrawn County 440s. They did gain a reputation for rough riding, leading to the rods and wheels being rebalanced, whilst double chimneys were fitted from 1959. When introduced, the counties, like the Kings, had some restrictions, being only allowed on the main lines to Penzance and Wolverhampton. However, unlike the Kings, they were allowed to spread their wings later on, with allocations at Shrewsbury, Nayland and Chester, and proved to be equal to the castles. As if to illustrate Hawkesworth's limitations, his last three locomotives were all pannier tanks, which the GWR already had an abundance of. The first, the 9400s, was an update on the 5700s, but based on the 2251s, with a tapered boiler and exposed smoke box. Intended for shunting, they were difficult to operate and at 6 tonnes heavier than the 5700s, severely restricted. The 1500s had been inspired by the USA shunters on the southern, with a short wheelbase and outside cylinders. Some components came from the 9400s and the class worked ECS turns around Paddington. Hawkesworth's final pannier was also the last design for the GWR. The 1600s had been based on the 2021 class dating back to 1897. All came under British Railways, with construction running from 1949 to 55, with number 1669 being the last Great Western locomotive from Swindon. Their duties were on branches barred to the 5700s, mainly in Wales and the West Country. With such a successful amalgamation of its own, very few locomotives survive from the GWR's constituents. The majority are from South Wales, with examples from the Taff Vale, Port Talbot and Cardiff Railways, plus the three narrow gauge railways. The company itself is represented by all designers dating back to the broad gauge era, with the exception of Joseph Armstrong. It has also been the biggest benefactor from Barry Scrapyard, with 98 locomotives saved, resulting in a wide variety of motive power. The bulk of the Churchwood fleet is made up of his heavy freight 280s, with 7 tender and 5 tanks. In 1985, one of the tender examples, number 2857, hauled a demonstration freight from the Severn Valley to Newport and return as part of the GWR 150 celebrations. Also to survive are two 4300s, with one, number 5322, being part of a batch of 11 sent to France during the First World War and used by the ROD from 1917 to 1919. The second is number 7325, a later example with an enlarged cab and modified front end. But the best known Churchwood locomotive is City of Truro. Something of a composite design, with double frames and a tapered boiler, she is credited with the first 100 miles per hour run. On the 9th of May 1904, whilst hauling an ocean mails train from Plymouth to Paddington, City of Truro is reputed to have reached 102.3 miles per hour on the descent of Wellington Bank. 
Despite this achievement, she was rejected for preservation by the GWR, but donated to the LNER by Collet. Displayed at York, she was restored for rail tour duties in 1957, earning her keep on the Didcot, Newbury and Southampton before retirement in 1961. Displayed at Swindon, a further period of operation came between 1985 and 1992. During this time, City of Truro visited the Netherlands to mark 150 years of Dutch railways. After a steam railway appeal, her latest period of work was from 2004 until 2013. Moving on to Collet, the castles have eight examples, with three acquired from BR. The first, number 4073 Caffilly Castle, was presented to the Science Museum by Dr Beeching. Another, number 4079 Pendennis Castle, was based in Australia from 1977 until 2000, when she was donated to the Great Western Society at Didcot. Number 4079 is one of six to have returned to the main line. Another is number 5051 Earl Bathurst, also at Didcot, and one of a batch renamed after Earls, whilst number 5029 at Nunny Castle has been active since 1990 and is part of the Locomotive Services Limited collection. Tysley is another user of castles, with three, all in different configurations. Number 5080 Defiant was part of a batch renamed after aircraft in 1941, sporting a single chimney and collet tender. By contrast, number 5043, Earl of Mount Edgecombe, has a double chimney and Hawkswood tender. The final castle at Tysley is number 7029, Clung Castle, a BR example from 1950 with a double chimney and four-row superheater. Purchased by Patrick Whitehouse in 1966, Clung Castle was one of the founding locomotives of the Birmingham Railway Museum when she went to Tisley in 1968. The larger kings have three members, with the first, number 60,000, King George V, being part of the National Collection. Formerly based at Bulmers in Hereford, she broke BR Steam Ban in 1971, working a four-day tour around the western region from Hereford via Newport, Kensington and Tisley. Running until 1987, number 60,000 was effectively replaced by number 6024 King Edward I, one of two saved from Barry. Rescued in 1974, she was restored at Quainton Road, first steaming in 1989. Mainline approved since 1990, King Edward I was the class's sole representative until the completion of number 6023 King Edward II in 2011. Her restoration required the casting of a new driving wheel, which had been cut whilst at Barry, and sports the original single chimney and BR Express Blue livery. On a smaller scale, none of the 4400s made it into preservation, but three of the 4500s did. Number 4555 was acquired by Patrick Whitehouse, working railtors from 1963 to 65, and is now based at Dartmouth. The 4575s have 11 members, with number 5553 being the last to leave Barry in 1990. Another, number 5521, returned to traffic in 2007, before making a tour of Eastern Europe, returning to the UK in 2009. Like the small prairies, none of the Churchwood large prairies survived the type being represented by 10 5101s and 1 6100. One of the 5101s, number 5193, was converted into a mogul by the West Somerset and renumbered 9351, with the sole 6100, number 6106, being based at Didcot. The most numerous class are the 5700s, with 16. Some came from industrial service, mainly the NCB in South Wales, but number 9642 was used as a shunter by Hay Scrapyard before its preservation. Upon withdrawal, 13 panniers were sold to London Transport between 1956 and 63. Number L89, formerly 5775, was acquired by the Keith and Worth Valley in 1970 being painted in an ochre livery for its role in the Railway Children film. Once again, Tysley has three examples. Two came from London Transport, 
numbers 7760 and 7752, with the latter hauling the last steam working by LT. The third is number 9600, purchased from the MCB's Merthyr Vale Colliery in 1973. Staying in Wales, the Manors have nine survivors, making for a third of the class total, and all have run at least once in preservation. Only one, number 7808 Cookham Manor, came directly from BR, with numbers 7802 Bradley Manor, 7812 Earlstoke Manor, and 7819 Hinton Manor having worked on the main line. Two of these have returned to the former Cambrian, the first being number 7819 in 1987, with number 7802 appearing in 2006. Number 7822 Foxcote Manor was based in Wales, firstly at Oswestry, Street, before being restored at Clangothlin from 1985 to 87, but is currently on the West Somerset. Two other manors can be found in the South West, where the class were used as pilots in South Devon. They are numbers 7827 Lydon Manor at Dartmouth and number 7828 Odney Manor on the West Somerset. The Bluebell is home to the only Duke Dog, number 9017 Earl of Barclay. Built using parts from Bulldog, number 3425, and Duke, number 3258, she was the last in service, being withdrawn in 1960. Moving to the Blue Bell under her own power, number 9017's nameplate came from Castle, number 5060, upon its withdrawal in 1964. The locomotive has had four operational stints, the latest being from 2003 to 14. In preservation, she has been paired with City of Truro, the only other double-frame locomotive, and in 2009 returned to Wales with a visit to Clangothlin. Hawksworth is represented by four of his panniers. The Sol 1500 is number 1501, purchased from Kearsley Colliery in 1970 by the Seven Valley, but didn't steam until 1997. Number 1638, meanwhile, was acquired directly from BR, and first based on the Dart Valley, before being sold to the Kenton East Sussex in 1992. The other two are from the 9400 class, with the first, number 9400, being on static display at Swindon. By contrast, number 9466 was rescued from Barry in 1975 and restored at Quainton Road. Since then, she has toured many heritage railways, as well as being a regular at the Steam on the Met series in the 1990s. His modified halls have six members after number 7927 Willington Hall became a spares donor. Number 6960 Ravesingham Hall is the only true GWR example, being outshopped in 1944, whilst number 6989 Whitewick Hall became the 150th Barry returnee. Number 6998 Burton Agnes Hall at Didcot is credited with hauling the last steam working on the western region, the 2.10pm York to Bournemouth from Oxford to Banbury in 1966. On the Great Central is number 6990 Witherslack Hall, who represented the GWR on the original Great Central during the 1948 exchange trials in the mixed traffic category. As we have seen, there are many heritage railways keeping the spirit of the GWR alive. One of the first was the Great Western Society at Didcot, started after four schoolboys acquired 1400 number 1466 and auto coach number 190. The collection slowly grew and housed at various sites rented from BR. Relocated to Didcot in 1967, the Society restored the 1932 engine shed and other structures, such as the coaling stage. The centre is unique, being rail-locked by the Bristol and Oxford main lines and a chord on the west side. It has three running lines, a branch, a main line and a section of Broadgate track. Rolling stock includes carriages ranging from the Dean to the Hawksworth eras and a variety of wagons. Recently, Didcot has seen several new builds in the form of a rail motor, Saint and Hawksworth County. One item of stock is rail car number 22, 
one of the examples from 1940 with angled ends. Purchased by the Society's Midlands Group, she came to Didcot in 1978 from the Severn Valley. Two other rail cars are number 4 of the original design at York and number 20 on the Kent and East Sussex. The Severn Valley follows the River Severn for 16 miles from Bridgenorth to Kidderminster. The first items of stock arrived in 1967 with the railway holding open days during its early years. Official reopening took place in 1970 to Hampton Lode. Progressing in stages, Kidderminster was reached in 1984 with a new station in the former goods yard giving the Severn Valley a mainline connection. An engineering facility is housed at Bridgenorth carrying out in-house and contract work. At Kidderminster, a carriage shed keeps the line's coaching fleet under cover, with withdrawn locomotives based in the engine house at Highley opened in 2008. The railway has a large collection of locomotives, with the GWR represented by traditional panniers and prairies, plus a hall, 2800, a mogul and three manors. Rolling stock includes carriages from the Churchwood, Collet and Hawksworth eras, supported by a fine collection of wagons. A former main line is that from Birmingham to Cheltenham, part of which is now the Gloucestershire and Warwickshire. Opened between 1900 and 1906, the route once carried the Cornishman Express. A preservation society was formed in 1976, but official reopening had to wait until 1984. Winchcombe was reached in 1987, with the station being relocated from Monmouth Troy. The next stage was to Gothrington, completed in 1997. The next two extensions were to Cheltenham in 2003 and Broadway in 2018, giving a total length of 15 miles. Motive power includes both types of 280 in the form of three tender examples and 4200 number 4270 alongside Manor number 7820 Dinmore Manor and Modified Hall number 7903 Formark Hall. In the southwest, the West Somerset is the UK's longest standard gauge railway at 22 and 3 quarter miles from Bishop Lydiard to Minehead. Closed in 1971, it reopened to Blue Anchor in 1976 and to Minehead in 1979. Two museums have been established at Blue Anchor and Bishop Lydiard, and two workshops at Minehead and Willerton. To the south, a connection has been made at Norton Fitzwarren, which, coupled to the turntable at Minehead, allows rail tours to traverse the line. Also in the southwest is the South Devon at Buckfastley on the former Ashburton branch. Closed to passengers in 1958 and to freight in 1962, the first items of stock arrived in 1965, with the reopening in 1969 being undertaken by Dr Beeching. Known as the Dart Valley, the railway purchased the Kingswear branch in 1973, becoming its main focus from 1989. At Buckfastley, the new South Devon Railway took over in 1991 and sets out to recreate a typical Great Western branch. The Clangothlin Railway runs for 10 miles along the former cross-country route from Rewabon to Barnmouth and is the only standard gauge line in North Wales. Its section is from Clangothlin to Corwin with the nearby Barla Lake Railway occupying the track bed from Barla to Clanuelklin. Considered a duplicate of the Cambrian line, it closed to passengers in 1965 and to freight in 1968. The Preservation Society moved in in 1975 and the first trains ran in 1981. During its reconstruction, the bridge over the River Dee needed heavy repairs, but was supported by the local council. Carog was eventually achieved in 1996, followed by Corwin in 2014, where a new station has been constructed. Joining the Cambrian was the two-foot, three-inch gauge Corris Railway, built to transport slate to McCumflith. When it was sold to the GWR in 1929, the Corris had four locomotives, 
and closed in 1948 after a bridge over the River Dovey was washed away by flooding. The two remaining locomotives were stored at McCunflith, being purchased by the nearby Tally Clean in 1952 for £25 each. They subsequently became number 3 Sir Hayden and number 4 Edward Thomas. Sir Hayden was outshot by Hughes of Loughborough in 1878 as an 040, but rebuilt as an 042 in 1900. She was chorus number 2 and kept going by the Great Western using parts from sisters numbers 1 and 3. Edward Thomas was delivered from Kerr Stewart in 1921 and fitted with a diesel ejector from 1958 to 69. She is named after the general manager, Bolzer Hayden was the owner of both the Chorus and Tally Clin. The Welsh Pool and Clan Fair closed in 1956, with the society being formed in 1960. Leased from BR, trains started running again in 1963, using the two original locomotives, which had been stored at Oswestry. Welshpool was reached in 1981, but the section through the town has been lost. The last narrow-gauge railway is the Vale of Rydal, sold to the Brecon Mountain in 1989. Since then, stock has been restored into GWR livery, and the locomotives return to coal firing, having been oil-fired since 1978. In 2015, a new workshop was established at Aberystwyth, the previous one being housed in the former standard gauge shed. This had been the case since 1968, when the railway was realigned into the main line station after the closure of the Carmarthen route. Future plans include a display of stock from the Phyllis Rampton Narrow Gauge Railway Trust. At Swindon, a museum has been created in the form of works, which closed in 1986. Opened in 2000, it replaced the original museum at Farringdon Road. The museum tells the social history of both the works and the Great Western. Locomotives range from a replica of North Star to King George V. There is also a variety of carriages and wagons, including a Royal Saloon from 1897. We end this programme with castles numbers 5051 Earl Bathurst and 5029 Nunny Castle passing Tainmouth with a rail tour in time-honoured fashion. And be sure to look out for other episodes in this series.